Good evening and welcome to Advocata's third roundtable on the role of tax administration in enhancing tax revenue. Sri Lanka has one of the lowest tax to GDP ratios in the world. And this is significantly below what would be considered a minimum level uh, required for the government to provide sort of basic services to its citizens. And this decline in tax revenue has been due to a combination of both tax policy and tax collection. Um, so to increase government revenue will require addressing both these issues, that is both the tax policy making as well as the tax administration. Uh, we have in many other forums, we have addressed some of the issues relating to tax policy. So in this round table discussion, we would like to focus uh, on the issues relating to tax administration. And to do that, to discuss this topic, we have with us two experts in this field. Uh, Mr. Hapuarachi is the current Commissioner General of Indian Revenue Department. He has over 35 years experience uh, in the department and has worked in many areas, um, particularly in tax policy making, tax compliance and international affairs. He also holds a master's in taxation policy and management from the Keiko University, Tokyo. Uh, Mr. Suresh Pereira is a principal, uh, principal of the tax and regulatory division of KPMG Sri Lanka. Uh, he, he has over a decade of experience and expertise in corporate tax, uh, corporate tax, mergers and acquisitions, tax restructuring services, and has made representations before appellate authorities in a number of uh, sectors. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to participate in this round table. Uh, before I kick off the discussion, uh, I will just set a few sort of housekeeping rules. Uh, I will start off the discussion by asking a few questions from our uh, resource persons, but we would also encourage our audience out there to please send in your questions uh, via uh, the Zoom, via Zoom through the chat function. Uh, so to start off the discussion, uh, I'll, I'll start with Mr. Hapu Arachi. Uh, you know, as I said, we have already discussed this whole issue of tax policy, but I think in Sri Lanka, we find that there has been a lot of, you know, and talk changes, frequent changes in tax policy and tax legislation, uh, as well as sometimes you have these retroactive taxes. How do the, all that affect tax administration? Uh, and and there, therefore the collection of taxes and what do you think needs to be done to sort of improve uh, this whole process so that we can improve our tax collection? Okay, good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, participate uh, for this very important uh, discussion as the Inland Revenue Department. Uh, of course, uh, it's a very valid question uh, uh, considering the current situation in the country. So uh, as you very correctly mentioned, uh, one of the first priorities is having a consistent tax policy. So uh, yeah, actually when you, having, when you are having some changes coming ad hoc, of course, uh, a consistent policy cannot be maintained. So maybe uh, yeah, for uh, one year or the next year, uh, the things are being changed and uh, the even for the tax administration and even for the taxpayers, tax consultants, those are the most important parts of this uh, I mean, uh, uh, taxation or tax system. So uh, they can't have a clear view of everything and also uh, if you think about the systems the systems cannot go on that way i mean uh, revenue monitoring system uh, with the lot of changes uh, but sometimes when we think about the policy changes uh, those things are a must so we have to uh, think about uh, it depends on those situations you know uh, uh, my other consideration about your question is uh, like everything, the macro level of the factors, I mean, macro level factors are affecting everything. When a country is having a sort of a 
uh, settled status quo of uh, so many things. Uh, those things are affecting the tax administration. Uh, if you uh, consider about, uh, there was a, a huge uh, tax gap in this country. Still, we are having that, uh, probably due to two aspects. One is the policy gap. The other one is the, of course, the administration gap. Uh, due to those two reasons, may have, I mean, as you very correctly mentioned, uh, tax to GDP has come down. There are reasons actually, as we understand. Uh, you know, actually, uh, the uh, I mean, something like uh, there are a lot of tax concessions uh, in this country, even uh, from time to time. Uh, in uh, even if you think about the recent past, after the war ended, uh, uh, from 2011, a lot of tax concessions have been granted. So maybe uh, the, uh, the production from uh, those activities are coming to GDP, but those are not taxed. That could be one reason, but I don't say that's the, the main reason. There are a lot of weaknesses in so many places. Uh, if you think about tax administrations uh, throughout the world, uh, yes, uh, there are reasons for uh, having uh, I mean, uh, a good ratio for tax to GDP and uh, maybe uh, something like a very low ratio for tax to GDP. Uh, our country situation is, I think, as I understand, a combination of so many issues. That's what I can say as the yes remarks for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I move to uh, uh, Mr. Pereira. Uh, Taking basically from a practitioner's point of view, uh, what would be your uh, take on this situation, and particularly focusing on the you know the value added tax because it's one of the most important sources of tax revenue in most countries. Uh, unfortunately, Sri Lanka experience with the collection of VAT has not been; it has consistently underperformed, and I think uh, this is partly due to these you know ad hoc changes, policy changes that have taken place. Uh, so, using that example, if you can sort of take us through what you think needs to be done to sort of improve uh, the policy making so that we can improve tax collection. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for inviting me to this forum. And uh, yes, Doctor directly started with the most uh, important topic uh, or the uh, the the subject that uh, everybody is uh, discussing when it uh, when they speak about the. Uh, Sri Lankan tax system, the inconsistency of the policies and the retrospective loss. Uh, yes, uh, and that impacts uh, all the businesses because the, the uh, businesses cannot plan their uh, capital budgets, etc. And uh, we, we do uh, find that even middle of the income tax year, financial year, year of assessment, the rates are changing. So that's uh, that becomes challenging, sometimes, sometimes uh, fascinating for the tax consultants also to come up with all sorts of uh, tax planning aspects. Uh, but yes, so basically the inconsistency and the frequent changes in the tax loss uh, is not a good thing. And uh, that has to be stopped. Now, why is that happening? That is because uh, we don't have proper uh, mechanism for tax policy making. There has to be a body that is uh, body that is stable, that is accountable for making tax policies, short term tax policies, long term tax policies, etc. But who decides the tax policies in Sri Lanka from time to time uh, when the lobby groups uh, make uh, uh, representations and also uh, when there is a need for cash uh, to the uh, state coffers, uh, straight away uh, tax, change, uh, tax rules uh, are being changed, which, is, which should not be the case. There has to be a plan with regard to the uh, tax, uh, tax collection and the tax policy making, which we don't have, unfortunately. Uh, due to the setup in Sri Lanka. Right, so talking about the VAT, uh, it's a good uh, topic again. Now, say in 1998, uh, we abandoned the concept of taxing turnover. Uh, the concept of uh, taxing the turnover is uh, widely accepted as uh, uh, not good because it leads to cascading, that means tax on tax. So, uh, as far back as 1998, uh, Sri Lanka decided to abandon the uh, taxation of uh, turnover and 
embrace the concept of taxation of value addition. So at that time we introduced the act, uh, GST, Goods and Services Tax Act of 1996, uh, with effect from 1-4-1998. And in 2002, uh, again, it was renamed as uh, uh, value added tax. So from there onwards, uh, we have seen the evolution of the uh, VAT system. So now what do we see? When we introduce the two things, one is basically, I think my main complaint with regard to uh, the system is, now in a country, you use uh, either the concept of taxing the turnover or uh, taxation on the value addition as the tool for collection of indirect taxes to the state. But what do we have in Sri Lanka? When we analyze from 1998, you can see most of the times we have had uh, both a hybrid system. We do have the concept of taxation, taxing the turnover as well as taxing the value addition. I think something that is unique that we find in uh, the world. Why? That is because we don't have a policy consistency. What we decided to abandon, we keep bringing back. Now, good example from first of, uh, uh, now we, we have introduced uh, what is called the social contribution levy. What is social contribution levy? Turnover tax in another name. On the turnover, a percentage of uh, tax is being levied 2.5%. So again, we are having a hybrid system. Uh, in 2019, uh, the NBT, which was again, nothing but uh, taxation of turnover, was abandoned, which was introduced in 2009. Why was it introduced in 2009? Uh, to fund the war, or with it, what, what was said was basically to build the nation for a short period. I can recall the budget speech at that time. Uh, for a very short period, a uh, few quarters, it was a few years, it was uh, introduced. And it took almost 10 years for it to be uh, uh, abandoned. And it was abandoned in 2019. And, and now we see that it is being reintroduced again in another name. So where is the policy consistency? Who is who, who's uh, who's making or who's uh, responsible for these uh, uh, policy uh, contradictions? So now, when you look at the VAT, I think the question that you ask from me is: VAT has been underperforming from the beginning. The reason is why. Now, for VAT to be successful in a particular jurisdiction, there are fundamental things that has to be satisfied. One is the VAT should be expanded, extended to cover most of the activities in a country. How is, the, how is VAT working? It's basically you calculate the value addition by uh, deducting the input tax from the output tax. For that, the, from the value chain, from the start of the value chain until the consumer, in every link, uh, without a break, there should be, uh, the tax on value addition should be connected. But if you break the uh, link in, the, in between, then if the link is broken at the middle of the chain, the cascading comes in. From business to when in B2B transactions, business to business transactions, if you break the chain in the middle, uh, that results in cascading uh, impact coming. And uh, on the other hand, if you break the, uh, if you uh, pro provide an exemption uh, in the last uh, chain, last link, then what happens is uh, the value of the proper value of uh, VAT that should come to the state uh, will be deprived. Of it, right? So now, when you look at the uh, list of exemptions, as of today, we have more than 130 uh, exemptions. Most of the big industries are not in the VAT, uh, VAT net. So this is the very reason why we have, uh, we have a case of basically underperformance of the VAT system, because we have not been uh, honoring the uh, fundamental aspects that should be there for the VAT system to be successful. We should not have uh, this concept of tax on turnover, the hybrid system. All activities should be uh, subject to VAT. In other words, we need to uh, cut down the number of exemptions that are in the VAT uh, exempt schedule. Right Now, when you look at a good, uh, the countries that uh, successfully adopt uh, VAT, where we say uh, VAT is, uh, VAT is uh, doing very well. Uh, the concept of valuation. Right? So it's in Singapore and New Zealand. Those are considered the number one and number two countries uh, when it comes to the concept of uh, success stories of concept of uh, taxing the value addition. The number of exemptions you can uh, are basically restricted to a single digit, less than five sometimes. 
Now compare that to Sri Lanka's uh, 130 plus uh, items. So that's that's the main reason. So we need to basically, we need to uh, get our act together. You take every budget, you find a new exemption is being introduced. Why is that new exemption being introduced? That is because the lobby the lobby groups approach the policymaker, the finance minister, and uh, ensure that uh, they are favored and. Uh, an exemption is uh, introduced uh, there. So gradually that list keeps uh, evolving. This is what we call in uh, VAT terminology, the exemption creep. Now that's that has to be stopped, that's one. Then in addition to that, uh, again, I will ask, uh, I will bring another impact, another, uh, another failure that I see. Now, when you consider, again, for VAT to be successful, so when, when you introduce VAT, First time in a country, the prices of goods go up naturally in the marketplace. And, but after a time, it stabilizes. So the fun, another fundamental rule with regard to the VAT administration is that there should not be frequent changes of the VAT rate. Now in Sri Lanka from 1998, if you count the number of times the VAT rate has changed, you can see more than 12 times Sri Lankan uh, VAT rate has changed. Now we go back to uh, New Zealand or Australia. How many times uh, the VAT rate has changed? Less than five, less than I would say even four basically I can recall. Uh, so this, this, is, this is a fundamental uh, reason why the VAT system is underperforming in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. I think uh, uh, from this we see that I think the, the whole institutional framework for tax policy making, for tax legislation, uh, developing tax legislation and implementation of taxes uh, is not has not been adequate or has is not suitable. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Hapoarache, I'll put it to you. Uh, what changes do you think should be should would you like to see in terms of this whole institutional framework for tax policy making, tax uh, legislation, and tax implementation? And should all these areas be sort of, uh, so I, I want to sort of uh, uh, relate it to the central bank in, in 1950, because we have monetary policy, we have fiscal policy. In 1950s, they set up the central bank and all monetary policy is done under one authority, that is the monetary policy, uh, uh, monetary board actually. Is such a, a structure, um, a similar structure warranted for fiscal policy making? Uh, and particularly tax policy making, should all of this come under one authority? Uh, any views on that? And would that improve a tax collection in the country? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, the answer for that is, I think we need some time to explain. But uh, uh, basically in that also, I think, uh, yeah, uh, if we can do everything in one roof, probably it will, uh, pay the dividends. Sometimes it is it is not like that. I, I think um, you may have uh, come to know that uh, some countries in the Scandinavian some Scandinavian countries uh, uh, they are having separate minister or ministry for taxation. One or two countries, not so many. Uh, actually, uh, they are different from the Minister of Finance also. So what they do is uh, doing everything under one roof, as you uh, just mentioned. Actually, uh, if we uh, keep the monetary policy aside for a while, uh, we can talk freely about the uh, fiscal policy or tax policy. Uh, that is about the government uh, revenue and the expenditure, public finance. So in that case, uh, yeah. Again, I really agree with uh, Suresh also. Uh, I mean, uh, what we have to do is having a, a thorough study for uh, thinking about so many years, around, let's say, 20 years. So if we can't do that, around 10 years, then uh, having a consistent policy. And when the policy, such a policy comes to the, uh, comes to being, uh, we can, it is, when, when it's visible, I mean, as the legislation, so the policy is the legislation, and then, of course, uh, we can uh, admin administer uh, such a policy 
without much uh, disturbances. So, uh, yeah, I think such a situation will pay the dividends for the country, uh, reaching the objectives of the, the policymakers and also uh, what they decide in the, the parliaments, I mean, the, the lawmakers, uh, what they approve also, maybe uh, a particular plan for so many years. So if we can go to a situation like that, uh, I think it will be better, but uh, sometimes there are various things happening in countries like us as, uh, I mean, the, 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 we are changing everything. If we uh, yeah, take some examples from India also, you will uh, understand that uh, when uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, gave that uh, changes, some radical changes, the changes uh, went, went on even with the changes of the, the governments. So I think something like that, if you can expect, uh, that would be, that would be much better to uh, have a better situation in this country about uh, tax administration and tax system. So that's my um, idea about, yes, uh, the second, um, the situation about having everything uh, done in the one roof. Even without one roof, uh, so many countries are performing well. Actually, some tax administrations are autonomous bodies from their ministries. Like, uh, like in Japan also, I have some experience there uh, by working with them for several months, I mean, one day per week, something like that. Actually, they are also having uh, the National Tax Agency coming under the Ministry of Finance, but uh, working uh, as a autonomous body, very independent. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I think you brought up a lot of uh, issues really that uh, relate to our tax, system, uh, uh, tax administration and maybe I, I'll put some questions to um, uh, Mr. Pereira. So I think you referred to sort of medium term, uh, medium term tax uh, strategy, uh, which is something that I think we don't really look at. We are, that's why it's already short term. We are looking from budget to budget, but do we have a medium term strategy, which is sort of aligned to our overall objectives of the economy? You, you refer to um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, and uh, I think when they did their, uh, you know, the reforms in 1991, how they sort of aligned, you know, fiscal policy changes with the overall objectives that they have for the economy. Uh, so in that context, uh, you, uh, Mr. Pereira, do you have any thoughts about how uh, we can maybe structure this whole tax policy, the whole, you know, framework yes. Yes. to, to, to provide this kind of uh, uh, institutional framework? Yes, so I think uh, I'll first touch on uh, the question that you raised, whether both uh, tax policy making, tax administration should be carried out by one institution. Uh, my view on that is, uh, I think it's uh, better to keep uh, both separate uh, because uh, this is like the case of a parliament is there to make laws, judiciary is there to interpret the laws. Uh, that could be conflict of interest if uh, both are uh, brought under one uh, one how to say one institution, uh, but of course both in uh, both the tax administration, the offices of the tax administration, uh, and uh, tax administrators and the policymakers should work closely together. That that is given, right? Uh, so what I advocate here is basically, the, did I speak about the National Tax Council? No, right? Yeah. So basically, uh, we, Sri Lanka badly needs a national tax council. Now, what I meant by uh, tax, national tax council is uh, people who are qualified, uh, about 10 of them, uh, forming a long-term policy committee involved in uh, designing short, medium, and long-term tax policies and ensuring that those are being implemented irrespective of change of government, irrespective of change of politics, uh, politicians, in respect of change of finance ministers. That's a crucial. So there is a long-term uh, strategy uh, for our uh, what's the tax, uh, tax policy. So then the, the, this inconsistency that we are talking of, et cetera, automatically gets eliminated. And this body should consist of independent uh, people. Tax professionals, accountants, uh, uh, 
uh, I would say economists, uh, etc., lawyers, etc., uh, should be in this body. Now, compared to that, I think there's a very important uh, point that uh, uh, Mr. Aparachi uh, brought out. Now, this tax is a very uh, complicated subject. When you do something in one area, you can see the impact coming in another area also. So if you are not a seasoned uh, tax uh, person, you will not realize that thing. So in that context, uh, the, the finance minister sometimes is not the best person to decide the tax policy also, because you need specialist knowledge. Now, he mentioned about the concept of having a tax ministry, or sometimes a minister in charge of tax. Uh, now, how are you going to select a minister in charge of tax? Again, you can't do it from the uh, 20, 20, uh, 225 people in the uh, parliament because they don't have that knowledge, right? So, are we talking about, okay, being a person from the nationalist and uh, then uh, uh, filling that uh, post? Difficult things. So, that's why I, said, that's why I added, okay, uh, let's not go there. Uh, let's not talk about a minister. Uh, let's talk about a national tax council where you can bring a body of uh, people together who can uh, decide the future of the tax strategy in, in Sri Lanka. All right? uh, then comes the tax administration. Now, what we need to do here is to ensure that we are going towards voluntary tax payment culture. In other words, people, we should ensure the people are paying taxes voluntary. Now, why would a person uh, not pay taxes uh, voluntary? But if a person sees that uh, his tax money is at work, the benefits that he gets, that's the way to convince a person to uh, pay the taxes. Now, that is the culture that we should uh, uh, develop in Sri Lanka. Now, if we see our tax money is uh, not being put to good use, then of course nobody is going to pay the taxes. So, what I call the representation, uh, what uh, what we call the hours of the taxation. No, basically uh, the revenue redistribution, repricing, the representation, the last hour. Because we we, we speak about the first three hours a lot, but last hour must be uh, I think emphasized, and I think that's that's the key to basically getting the taxpayer confidence moment that people start believing uh, the tax money is being used, put to good use and that may give uh, benefit to the society, then I believe, I won't say everybody, majority of them will start believing in the tax system and start going in for a voluntary payment culture. And I think that's, uh, that's the broader, uh, uh, broader the, the framework that we should be looking at. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. I think uh, you brought out a lot of issues and uh, more questions than answers in, in the sense of how we are going to you know, uh, structure this. So this National Tax Council, because we lack expertise, and I think that was brought up. So I just want to... Uh, yes. one at one point? Sure. So I think into that one, I, I also suggest that we, are, we should have a tax ombudsman. Uh, once upon a time in Sri Lanka, there was a tax ombudsman, I, uh, I can recall that was uh, uh, Justice uh, Maxwell Parnagama. Uh, he was appointed as a tax ombudsman under a cabinet paper, the constitution that was devised by the cabinet, but that had no legal foot. So, but, but that was a very good concept where we used to go behind him uh, and to take, take up the uh, grievance of the taxpayers. Now, the role of the tax ombudsman is not to interpret the tax law. This is basically when there is malpractice, when there are uh, shortfalls uh, in the tax administration to take those issues to the uh, tax ombudsman and tax ombudsman to give directions to the commissioner general to implement those. Now, where it failed was, or where it was ineffective, I would say was, there was no uh, legal enforceability for the recommendations, directions given by the tax ombudsman because it was created by the cabinet, not by the parliament. So there has to be a statute creating a tax ombudsman with teeth uh, with power to directions to the Commissioner General, and that I believe will uh, bring in a lot of faith uh, in the taxpayers that whenever there is injustice, that there is a forum that they can go to. So I think that's another institution that we should uh, bring into the Sri Lankan tax system, in addition to the National Tax Council. So definitely, I think these are the areas I think that have been uh, and, and there's a question here actually that we've had several taxation commissions actually T taxation commissions have sat 
they have deliberated, they have submitted reports. And I think a lot of these recommendations have been, have come within this, I mean, come uh, through these taxation commission reports. But why have they not been implemented? I think that's a question that's been asked. Why has have these not been implemented? Uh, any I, thoughts on I, that? I, okay, that's an important point, right? Now, uh, in 2011, there was a tax, uh, tax uh, presidential taxation commission that was appointed. In fact, I had uh, gone before that also made representation. And uh, so certain certain uh, proposals that were made to the taxation commission, I believe they were the they were in the report and they were uh, implemented. Not all, but at the same time, that report has not made uh, not that has not been made uh, uh, public. I have not seen. I don't know whether uh, commission general has uh, seen that one. So what is the purpose of having a commission uh, collecting all the uh, all the people going behind uh, in front of that and uh, giving uh, their thoughts and then commission members deliberating and coming up with the recommendations and the report and if that report is not uh, available to the uh, relevant people. Right, so that, that basically uh, answers the question I think from, from the audience. Uh, but okay, so going forward, how do we improve it? I think uh, one thing that came up a lot was, okay, you need the right people, you need the right expertise. Um, particularly, I think you need uh, tax accountants, you need lawyers, you need auditors um, who, who are able to uh, handle all the different functions. So, um, and, and you talked about the resource country, uh, resources actually, so uh, uh, the revenue, uh, the, being an autonomous body. So in that sense, they should be able to be self-financing so that they are not dependent on the budget, right? So I think that's very important to be able to be autonomous. Um, so Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, currently, if you look at the current system, what are the sort of shortfalls you see? Are you able to uh, track, given the kind of salary scales that are there, the kind of uh, recruitment processes, are you able to attract the talent that you need, uh, which is required really to, to run a, tax uh, administration uh, or a, a tax um, department. Uh, and what changes do you think you would like to see to improve this process? Okay, uh, before answering uh, this question, uh, I think better to, uh, yeah, if you allow me to comment on two points of Mr. Suresh, uh, indicated by Mr. Suresh. Uh, one is about the National Tax Council. Yeah, actually we can, that's a good step rather than uh, having a, a ministry. I mean, um, yeah, actually uh, even 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 in the ministry, I think in those countries, there may be, a, um, I mean, some people who are experts uh, in the council or like that something, uh, I mean, giving some proposals to uh, the minister. So that's how the ministry will work on such taxation, uh, I mean, tax system how to tax and how to decide the policy, something like that in those countries. So in a country like us, I think most probably the better, the best option is, uh, is the uh, having a tax council like that. And also about the ombudsman uh, that uh, the proposal, I think that's also a very, very important one. And also uh, it's uh, timely as uh, actually a person who is uh, aggrieved or maybe, uh, I mean, a sort of, uh, I mean, the person who uh, came under a particular harassment or something like that, he can go to the ombudsman and then, uh, yes, maybe due to some, you know, all the officers are not like same. So maybe sometimes there can be some missionaries like that. Then the ombudsman will uh, decide and uh, yes, order the Commissioner General to uh, do the needful. I think it's a good concept if you can have something like that, or maybe a particular uh, legal authority or something like that, in that case. Okay, uh, your second situation, the question is about uh, having uh, sort of a uh, efficient tax administration with, with uh, some resources and like that. Yeah, oh, okay, I think uh, most of the countries uh, are having uh, the enough resources in their tax administration. Sri Lanka is not an alternative. Sri Lanka is also having, um, I mean, good people, uh, educated people. 
uh, who has uh, some background on taxation after joining the Inland Revenue and the Ministry of Finance, of course, they are getting some train, training, I mean, and there are certain uh, exams also, uh, you know, um, especially uh, on tax system and taxation, and they have to uh, learn for that and get through the exams also. But the thing is that I think, yeah, if you think about the macro level factors in the country, let's say there's a country, country A, country A is having a lot of, uh, I mean, malpractices or misconduct practices happening in that country. Let's say something like, uh, I mean, the most of the people are, the society affects everything. That's what I wanted to say. Let's say uh, there's a, uh, there are some research done in some countries about that also. I have read some papers. Uh, let's say in particular country, uh, the corruption is at a very high level. Or maybe there are sort of uh, other uh, bad situations are also there. Then tax administration of that country cannot be a very efficient one, a very effective one. Actually, those things are affecting, you know, uh, I mean, that when we think about taxation, tax administration alone, alone, or I mean, the policymakers alone can't do everything. Or again, as we uh, correctly discussed here, uh, tax officer, tax practitioner or tax consultant, and the most important player, tax payer. So all the three guys are very important. Uh, I mean, if it is to be a successful, they should play their level best. I mean, uh, there's a, a fair game to play by them. So with very efficient people, knowledgeable people, or maybe uh, highly paid situations also, maybe if we think about three guys, A, B, and C. A is the taxpayer, B is the tax consultant, C is the tax officer. Probably A, taxpayer, doesn't want to go for some corrupt practice. But due to the sort of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, appeal laws, sort of uh, plan of the tax consultant as well as tax officer, he will go for a, a corrupt practice and then the government uh, revenue is reduced because he doesn't pay the correct amount of tax. And maybe all the people are very yeah, educated though, maybe uh, very efficient everything, but still it can happen. So your answer for your question is that I took a long time to answer, but anyway, answer is that even if you uh, employ uh, very efficient people, knowledgeable people, only that won't uh, find a solution for the issues sometimes faced by a tax administration. Okay, so you brought up a very, very important issue. Uh, what you're saying is I think the tax culture or the, the culture in the country really, or the values uh, that people, uh, you know, espouse to, are very important in terms of getting people to pay taxes. And I think one thing that even uh, Ms. Pereira you referred to is this sort of the social contract between the government and, the, and its people, right? If you feel that the government is providing adequate services or at good quality services, then you have a, uh, you, you, the, as a taxpayer or as a citizen, uh, you will feel like paying your taxes or you would you know, be more uh, conscious about paying your taxes. So, there, is, there needs to be a good contract between the government and its citizens. Uh, and if that contract is broken, then sometimes you will, uh, you will inevitably find that there will be less revenue uh, paid. But I think what uh, Mr. Aparachi you brought out was also this whole thing of the tax paying culture. Now, I think in the last, uh, the interim budget, now we're trying to increase tax, you know, the, the number of taxpayers or the number of, I mean, the amount of taxes that are collected. So one proposal that was um, brought in in the last interim budget was basically to, to, uh, to uh, direct all uh, citizens over 18 years of age to open a tax file. 
Now, do you think that kind of policy is going to help you to raise more revenue? Uh, what, what, what is your reading of that uh, policy? Uh, and, and do you think that is going to be effective in raising more revenue? Yeah, uh, yeah. it will, again, uh, yes, uh, raise more revenue if it uh, operates well. Uh, actually, we shouldn't uh, misunderstand this proposal. Uh, I mean, uh, however, the, the proposal was made uh, saying that the income tax file is not income tax files. First, uh, some sort of a registration. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, if you think about having a unique number for a particular uh, individual, for everything he does in that country, for a I mean, take a citizen and then uh, for him, he, there's a particular number, maybe he's having some national ID number or something like that, but in addition to that, or even that uh, NIC number can be used for that, having a number, when he goes to a particular place and uh, maybe he spends some money, some investments is, are done, and maybe probably he gets a particular uh, big uh, purchase of a very valuable item, right? Or everything for all these transactions, or maybe he is going to a hospital. Right? Most of the countries are having this system, I think. So when you go to a place like that, uh, you can't do that type of transaction without uh, having that particular number. Right? So, uh, I mean, everything is now recorded. So after uh, getting the registration, uh, there is no need to pay tax at once. Yeah, let the registration will go for several years. Maybe, for example, let's say he's an undergraduate after uh, the graduation coming off of the university, uh, probably he may be getting a, uh, some sort of a, maybe some professional qualification also, and then he goes to practice. Maybe he's getting some money for his services provided to others. And then uh, such services are, of course, uh, I mean, coming under a particular number and the, the particular tax authority in that country, let's say in our case, IRD, can take such information. The, there, are so, some, some, uh, there should be some sort of a linkage also for that. Uh, there should be good systems. Thereafter only, maybe under, actually at the age of 18, he was registered, but he's coming to the liability when he was only, when he becomes only uh, 25 years of age, something like that. So. Uh, whatever he gets, uh, I mean, whatever he gets as revenue for him, whatever he gets as income for, for him, then, of course, uh, yes, we can think about having a file. Again, we have to understand that uh, if it is something like the professional you know, business or professional, uh, he's a professional or maybe a particular business, then the net income is tax, not the gross. So like that, we can operate such system. Having um, the registration uh, is at 18 is, I think, people should not uh, misunderstand this. Uh, it's good in that sense, if it operates like that. So, so I believe that this, yes, yes. please. Yeah. Wait, now, the, the objective here is to enhance the tax revenue, right? So uh, two things there. Basically, now, this is a proposal, this 18, 18 year old uh, to register is also with the intention of uh, enhancing the tax revenue, right? Now, in relation to something that uh, Mr. Apolati pointed out earlier also, the question that you asked, whether there are enough resources at the Indian Revenue Department to carry out tax administration. Uh, now, Mr. Apolati is at the top of the pyramid, right? So I am basically the person who goes in and out of the uh, Indian Revenue Department. I've been in the tax practice for more than 20 years now. So what I see is, uh, I think tax officers, have the number of files some tax officers have is too much. So what happens is when you get you know, tax files means the number of tax payers that they have to uh, handle. So when that is uh, when that number is large, what happens is uh, the uh, the work that they can do, the assessments and all that is substandard. Yes. So what should happen here is taking the taking into consideration the number, the size of the taxpayer, companies, conglomerates, et cetera. Uh, you must re reduce the number of uh, tax uh, payers a 
you must have like say you can take up a doctor if a doctor has too many patients that doctor can't concentrate uh, concentrate uh, on even a single patient uh, properly so you need to have a, a benchmark uh, in relation to how many tax pay, uh, tax files should be allocated to a particular uh, tax officer i think that's that's the starting point uh, and then the proper training now what this this tax of now when you say tax base we have different types of tax base you get the financial services you get the insurance now you get the logistic uh, service providers now their transactions are totally different so just because uh, you are a tax officer that does not mean you can uh, do a proper job if you don't understand the tax payers business activities and it takes some it takes a long time for us to study and understand the business activities when you understand the business activities then you can monitor and see whether this uh, tax base accounting for the taxes properly or not where are the uh, gaps that are there so my suggestion is here uh, now i looked at the 2021 uh, performance report now how many people are working under mr apuarachi 2400 this is 2022 right now i can recall i looked at this uh, report long time back also at that time also it was 2000 uh, plus so i think uh, notwithstanding the taxes uh, or the, the tax system becoming complicated and the number of tax payers increasing uh, there hasn't been a real increase of the number of tax officers uh, correct me uh, if i'm wrong right so rather than appointing uh, state ministers and the parliamentarians it's better to basically uh, focus on uh, increasing the number of uh, tax officers at the inland revenue department that will uh, increase the efficiency of the tax collection i know that's my, my view we all say that okay that rather, so rather than recruiting uh, numbers to other state departments i think this is the institution uh, that uh, needs uh, more manpower if the tax administration uh, to be uh, made efficient so sorry so th that's that i would take that uh, approach rather than just uh, saying okay 18 all 18 years to be registered because this is going to only result in a uh, overload of information and when the existing tax officers cannot handle the work that they have uh, i don't think this is going to if it will we are keep up with finger fingers crossed and see whether that will uh, bring in results Okay, right. Thank you, and I think uh, as much as numbers, I think uh, yeah, maybe now just increasing the numbers is not going to be the solution. But I agree with Mr. Apuraj that maybe we can start with this, you know, uh, at least having this unique ID number. And I think we started this process like some time ago. Uh, there was a project to get this unique ID to have it linked to the banks, to the motor vehicle department, the uh, land registry, and you know have have some kind of sharing of information. uh if we could do this for the qr code for fuel i don't see why we can't do it you know very very quickly uh, so i think this is something that is probably a national priority and we should really try to do that so that we, we can link you know all the databases uh, which i think is the first step towards the, you know getting citizens to start opening files so i hopefully we can take this up uh, quickly but I, i also want to take up a point of you know uh, this whole thing of one thing is Uh, the tax officers are inundated with files and there are too many files but also the other question is all that question i have is you know we have a, a explosion of new activities in the economy particularly e-commerce digital the digital economy and i think these are going to pose serious challenges to for tax collection because they require different type of skills you have to have different type of training uh, how how is the you know uh, uh, the tax department geared to you know uh, taxing these emerging sectors in the economy uh, and i think particularly with covid you can see how the expansion or explore you know of the of these sectors how uh, are we geared to you know addressing these issues and bringing these sectors you know how do we even address the taxation of these sectors of the economy yes yeah can i take <laughs> yeah so let, i think uh, before coming to that question we need to again go back to our tax culture the ecosystem that we have now when you look at other countries in their universities there's tax research happening there are tax surveys happening uh, so latest development in the tax world international uh, taxes etc foreign countries all are being uh, studied very well so from there the lessons are learned and those lessons are being uh, adapted implemented 
But in Sri Lanka, if you look at our universities, we don't have any tax basis taking place. We don't have any tax service taking place. So it's, it's a very uh, tax culture that we have. So where do we get our tax people? Okay, we have tax people in the internal department, and then we have the tax practitioners, mostly concentrated in uh, accountancy firms. Other than that, we don't have tax professionals. So where are we going to uh, study this? Now, tax professionals, uh, the, the tax practitioners, okay, what are they doing? Basically, they are handling their clients, and they are trying to make a living, and basically giving tax advice. So there is no uh, proper tax research happening. now. The, take a take case of basically the tax holidays. So the tax holidays have benefited Sri Lanka over the years, or have they drained the Sri Lankan uh, state costs? Uh, the state, even that we have not, we don't have numbers. We don't have carried out. Uh, we, no research has been carried out. That's because of the uh, the ecosystem. Now the new concepts that are taking place, the the the, the digital taxation. Uh, the e-commerce. Now, what are the policies uh, uh, that we should adopt? What are the developments that are taking place in uh, other countries? Uh, now, that is not being seriously studied and implemented here in Sri Lanka. Uh, the BIPs, base erosion, uh, uh, erosion uh, profit shifting. Uh, there's not much focus in uh, Sri Lanka. Very important concept. Uh, online trading. Uh, what are the tax policies that we should go for? Now, good day, good day, some of online, online, tech, online, uh, uh, online uh, businesses. Now, Sri Lankan online businesses, because of our brick and mortar inland revenue act, uh, they get caught uh, for taxes, right? But uh, when it comes to uh, the cross border online traders, they go tax free. Now, in other countries, they have all these concepts like Google tax and all that. Uh, uh, new new uh, tax rules being implemented introduced to their tax codes to capture those kinds of activities which are not uh, captured by the brick and mortar uh, tax statutes that we have. So our tax statutes have to evolve. But the, the, the way the businesses are being uh, carried out in the world has changed. So to keep it up, we need to have that body that is going to study this and uh, come up with rules for Sri Lanka. Now, two, if I'm not mistaken, two times uh, in our budget speech, uh, there were proposals to uh, address this issue with regard to the uh, <laughs> uh, online travel agents. And uh, also, now these companies like eBay, online cross-border uh, cross uh, uh, traders, online traders, never implemented. Never implemented, though it came into the uh, budget speech. Now, there are reasons for this. So now that's why I said, again, I emphasize the concept of the National Tax Council. Hopefully, there will be more productive uh, policies that will come uh, even to address this kind of uh, scenarios. Thank you, Mr. Parer. I think, um, in a sense, we don't have to reinvent the wheel because there are countries exactly. that have already, I mean, much further ahead in these areas. And it's a matter of actually researching, finding out how it has been done in other jurisdictions, and then implementing it. Uh, would you like to add something to that, uh, yeah, Mr. Paraji? I just wanted to add something when we yeah. talked about, uh, yeah, very correctly about the base erosion and port shifting project, uh, uh, which is coming on with the uh, collaboration of OECD and also so many uh, countries coming under G20 and um, I mean also UN. Actually, the very correctly you asked about this taxation of digital transactions. Uh, yeah, India is uh, one of the first comers for so many things. Yes, uh, their tax system is better than so many countries. Uh, so they introduced several years ago uh, equalization tax at 6%. Uh, to, it, it, the name of the tax was equalization. So equalization is something like, you know, actually, when it comes to a physical transaction, the costs are high. When it comes to digital transactions, e-commerce, then the costs are lower. To make it a balance, India introduced that with that concept. And also uh, OECD, uh, under this BIPS project, there are 15 actions recommended. Under action two, it talks about the digital transactions, digital economy or something like that. They talk about that. Under that also, there is a, uh, they, they have uh, proposed a solution coming under two pillars, uh, you know, considering two ways. But sometimes some 
uh, activities are of course some recommendations are not uh, suitable for uh, sri lanka sometimes some country like sri lanka but uh, you know even within that there are some good uh, proposals uh, so uh, under this uh, digital uh, economy or i mean uh, the under uh, action 2 of the oecd bips project they have recommended and so many countries have signed that uh, sri lanka is having some issues with uh, signing that actually so anyway uh, having something like uh, taxation of digital activities uh, actually we have given we have i mean taken the reports also about some uh, amounts about uh, the digital i mean the e-commerce transactions from central bank reports uh, actually if we can tax that we can have some control also we can have some uh, revenue which is going out to the foreign countries and foreign companies uh, very very correctly he said that uh, mr pera said that uh, i mean uh, the, the when it is a particular local company doing e commerce it is taxed correct uh, but something like that also should be taxed so we have to consider much on that there are proposals i think there was a um, amendment to a finance act also sometime that is empower yeah. icta to register yes but yes. Uh, did not go through yeah <laughs> so just uh, going back to your thing on you know this global minimum tax agreement i think yes that's, that's i think out of 140 odd countries about 130 countries really signed the agreement sri lanka was one of the few countries that did not sign this agreement i mean is there a case for not signing agreement i mean what what are the pros and cons of not signing it and uh, should we really be uh, going into this agreement yeah i think we can't talk much on that at the moment uh, there should be a thorough study by the policy makers and then they should decide uh, what to do we are the tax administration we also can give some signals what's happening uh, around the world what what should be done to have a better revenue something like that so we can do that but uh, the policy makers must decide Uh, sometimes you know these countries very correctly you said uh, there were some sort of a political dissent so we can't talk much about that actually suresh and me are helpless in that case <laughs> mostly but uh, suresh situation is better than me <laughs> so that's what i have to say about that actually so i, I think i'll put it to can, suresh as well particularly since some of our taxes are even below. a lot of our companies don't a lot of these export companies or there are some you know several companies that are exempt from tax or zero there's a zero rated taxes uh, some kind of companies that are taxed at 14% now here the minimum tax is a 15% tax by not adhering to these and not complying with these are we as a country going to lose out on tax revenue yes so there are this is actually this is a big topic we have to yes, analyze yes. in uh, detail but uh, let me give a little bit of uh, uh, headlines here now when you look at the when you look at uh, let's say the interest and dividends going out of sri lanka uh, we find that uh, dividends paid to foreigners foreign non residents uh, is totally tax free there's no withholding uh, tax uh, and they have no liability to file the return and uh, pay the taxes also also interest in relation to foreign loans uh, there is no tax it's again tax free uh, almost like the uh, dividends now the interim budget proposal indicated that that there may be a change uh, with regard to dividends going forward from next year onwards but let's keep our fingers uh, crossed there uh, also uh, more than that i think the bips one is again another topic that probably we should discuss uh, at length basically whether we should uh, sign that or not uh, again we need to have the data we, i don't think we should just uh, take the decision okay we are not going to be a party to it uh, just like that because uh, what is going to specifically in the context of the port city <laughs> what uh, how it's going to get affected there uh, and uh, yeah so that's why i said again i keep coming back to now who's the who's the part who is the person that's going to decide this and take these policies there is no body studying this so this is why again i say that we need to have this national tax committee uh, in, who's going to be responsible for all this thing so there's a party that is accountable there's a party that is responsible so there are so many things to be carried out in the tax 
so I think there's another point that you brought out uh, about tax incentives. And I think that again is another issue because can't we have given lots of tax incentives with the, of course the objective of trying to attract investment. But I think there's more and more uh, evidence that tax incentives alone are not enough or, or not, uh, tax incentives are not the most important thing in driving or in attracting investment. There are so many other uh, uh, you know, factors that really matter much more. Uh, and in that sense, but, but we have still given many tax incentives. We have several, you know, uh, it, it, under different laws. So under the BOI Act, under the England Revenue Act, and now the Strategic Development Act, uh, there are, you know, multiple laws under which these tax incentives are given. And these tax incentives can be very costly because they all, because they are basically, it's a revenue loss to the government. But as you rightly pointed out, we have never done this kind of analysis of how much are we losing? Are the numbers. Yes, exactly. Uh, so who needs to do that? And how, how can we even start doing this? I know under the last IMF program, I think this was one area that they wanted the government to start looking at, you know, every budget to put out, uh, you know, to do this calculation. But who should do it? And how do we even start looking at these tax expenditures? So this I said, when it comes to the Sri Lankan tax uh, ecosystem, we have the mm -hmm. Inland Department with 2,400 officers there, and then there is the Finance Ministry, and there is a sing always a, a single tax person uh, in charge there, and uh, nobody else uh, other than other than that uh, in relation to taxation officially from the point of view of the state government. Uh, we don't get much help from the university system in Sri Lanka, and so there's nobody who is. Uh, really in charge so that's that's the issue here this up for us do you like to add something of who who actually yeah, can do about, this kind uh, of analysis is yeah, it important yeah. okay that's very correct so why can't endocardo do something on that <laughs> and uh, actually the tax expenditure is of course a very big issue for sri lanka um, i mean a lot of um, tax tax incentives in the caliber of let's say tax concessions concessionary rates double deductions, triple deductions, and also uh, exemptions, so many things. But uh, actually- Is there a benefit coming from that? Is basically- Yes, uh, is yes a big of, course, of course. Given basically, or mostly with the objective of uh, taking the investments, increasing the investment, FDIO, local investments. But uh, I think uh, maybe some time, uh, maybe uh, some periods, of course, it has paid sort of uh, some uh, good dividends, but not all. After so many years, now we have come to this situation. So situation is very bad, as we all know, in the country, uh, having a lot of debts to be paid. Uh, so a lot of tax breaks were also given. We lost a lot of tax revenue also. Uh, so the expenditure is very high. Uh, yes. I think uh, IMF also did a, a particular visit uh, to Sri Lanka in 2012, and also we also support you for that. Uh, in that report, they talked about uh, tax expenditure. Uh, yes, uh, and recommended, uh, of course, uh, regarding VAT system also, uh, about SVAT also in that particular report. And again, in another study in 2016, so those are the things. So we have to learn the very lessons, as uh, Surya said, so many lessons to be taken from our own experiences as well as other countries' experiences. And then still, uh, to be optimistic, I think we can do a better job uh, if all are coming together and do something honestly for the country. If I take one point from uh, what he mentioned, the lessons from the other countries, this is something that I also have uh, been thinking a lot. Now, if you look at from 1978, from, from the time of the introduction of the Greater Colombo Economic Commission Act, we have been giving tax holidays. We give it's zero tax holiday, it's zero. Whereas you take a country like Ireland, now what, what is their strategy? They have a very reduced uh, uh, tax rate, 12% uh, sometimes back you know? and then effective tax rate sometimes it's like 12 uh, 2.5 so now because of that low tax regime uh, they somehow get the uh, transactions to go through so you take the big uh, tech companies the global tech companies they ensure uh, their royalties etc are 
uh, taken through uh, island companies uh, because of this uh, low tax regime. The other strategy is you, yes, you do offer uh, low tax rate, but you there is some tax collected. So investors that wouldn't have come there, uh, go there, but they end up paying tax. The, their transaction values are very high. So a low percentage of tax that's collected from that uh, strategy is huge to the government, but there's tax collected. Strategy is to reduce the tax rate, but but to collect uh, overall to collect taxes. Now, our experience is tax rate is zero. What is the tax collection? That is also zero. So, what is the strategy? You know, so this is something that I keep uh, asking: whether are we doing the correct strategy here in the first place? So, in that sense, actually, by I think doing this tax expenditure analysis, yeah, I think yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, of course, uh, very correct. So, we are always thinking about. Uh, tax system or tax sort of incentives to attract the uh, the FDIO I mean local uh, yeah uh, increase in the local investments. But actually, uh, before that, we have there are other so many other things. Uh, I mean, in the line before tax, uh, which is deciding about the investments, right? Think about uh, some activities or some situations of our country about other factors. Yeah, the economic stability, yeah, that's the thing. Political stability. That's the thing. Exactly. That's the thing. So, uh, taxation is something down the line. So, we are always thinking about once the taxes are reduced, the investors will come. Yeah. So, so I think doing this tax analysis, I think, and and that advocate, you you suggested advocate do it, and we actually have tried to do it. <laughs> we have tried to do it. Unfortunately, information is not available yes, because yes, these yes, companies yes, don't have to issue. publish. Their accounts, they don't. Uh, so I think there okay. has to be some kind of, uh, you know, transparency, even if they don't. Uh, government, I would say, doctor, I would say that uh, the government intervention. Now, if it is the, uh, if the government is a part of that exercise, then the uh, access to the information is available via the Inland Revenue uh, Department. A private institution. Uh, does not have the access to that information because of the confidentiality and the uh, other laws that are there uh, to prevent uh, getting access to uh, this kind of information. So government actually has to be a part and parcel of it. But but even then, I think when they don't pay any taxes, they have no obligation to submit any kind of thing. So there has to be some kind of minimum, as you said, some you know threshold, some you know threshold tax or some way. At least they have to provide the annual reports to the Inland Revenue Department or whatever agency, so that this kind of analysis at least can be done on a regular basis. So I think this is something that has to be uh, thought out. And also this thing of, you know, some sunset clauses. So even if you do give ta tax incentive, there has to be an end. There has to be some kind of, you know, uh, there has to be some kind of rules-based system where, you know, once the company starts earning, uh, uh, you know, profits, then this whole thing, you know, has to be. Uh, there there has to be, be sunset clauses. Advantage uh, that there's been advantage to the economy. There should be evidence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think th these are things that uh, have to be implemented or put in place. But again, the question is, who is responsible for doing this? Who needs to come together to do this? Because we are talking. I mean, we have talked about so many different aspects of tax collection and one one thing that we have not raised actually and we, i did not talk about is we have three revenue collecting agencies you're only one right the inland revenue department with the customs department with the excise department and i know there have been proposals in the past to bring these revenue agencies together uh, i mean is that still on the cards can that work and is that sort of one of the solutions but who is really responsible for doing all this you are talking about, uh, I mean, taking all the uh, revenue authorities in Sri Lanka under one umbrella. Yeah. So that is one thing. So when we talk of, that, you know, yeah, is is that something that needs to happen? Yeah, that depends. I mean, the performance. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the, if you think about again about that, I agree with uh, some comments made by Mrs. Grace some time ago when the discussion was started. Uh, about uh, having sort of uh, autonomy, I mean, uh, maybe uh, the policy and the 
the the administration going separately like that even within the revenue authorities i think uh, they are uh, taxing different activities or different amounts or something like that the tax bases are different and also maybe having a sort of administration on that uh, at upper level is of course uh, if it uh, pays well i mean if it uh, if the, the objectives are reached then of course it will be okay but uh, there should be sort of a genuine effort for everything uh, but again it will depend on so many other things so therefore uh, if you talk about uh, you know taking all the uh, revenue authorities together uh, yeah maybe uh, there there should be some sort of autonomy for all these three institutions in sri lanka and also uh, to have some sort of a monitoring or something like that it can yeah we can try even such a thing yes i don't know whether it will happen in future let's see let wait and wait and see what will happen yes. from a tax payer point of view how yes. how do you see it because obviously it must yeah, be a, 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 yeah, a difficult easy. question to answer but uh, what i can say is right now definitely the answer is no in this uh, environment uh, trying to do that basically can result in a total disaster because you have to keep in mind there are other elements uh, involved also definitely basically the aspect of the how basically the trade union and the uh, uh, how the revenue officers in those three units will uh, respond now at the end of the day it's a matter of basically how you handle the people now if you don't handle this uh, it's, it's a sensitive issue so in this environment if you try to uh, do something that uh, there will be resist uh, that will be resisted by the revenue officers uh, i we can have a, you can understand where we are right now so right now it's not the correct time to do it but in the long run whether we should do it uh, yes then we need to uh, study that and see because if, when you look at the other countries also you can certain countries yes uh, you do find uh, under one umbrella all three institutions uh, operating you take the uk hrm uh, uh, they are and basically i think even the ato australian tax office uh, etc you have that thing but okay you take india uh, the income tax and uh, excise or the customs is uh, together whereas the one import duty is totally outside there so you you find a different uh, practices uh, around the world so whether we should do it and if you're going to do it how we are going to do it, how how do you map that uh, path <laughs> it's something has, that has to be done uh, very carefully and not something that you can you should do overnight in a rush uh, if you try to do that thing that can result in a total disaster so i i won't recommend to do that thing uh, during uh, in the short run not in this environment so, so we've got a question that has come from the audience basically um, they say given all these you know issues that we have talked about and the low tax revenue can the england revenue department I, i would just say you know can the government itself prepare national level tax policy for the country and get agreement from all political parties so that whatever the government that comes in that there will be consistency in this this you know policies can carry through even if there's a government a change in government uh, is that something that is feasible workable Okay, let me let me put it this way. Tax is a highly specialized uh, area, so my understanding, tax uh, political people, politicians don't understand taxation. So basically, trying to uh, bring them to a common uh, ground in relation to something that they don't understand is uh, not something that we should be even <laughs> discussing. I would say that. So that, that this is why I said basically, but we need to have again it's a, the national tax policy. consisting of competent people uh, who will not be uh, swayed by the politicians or political parties but who will take decisions in the best interest of uh, national economy and also not uh, because of the lobbying uh, the strong voices that are coming so that's uh, my recommendation mr aparach what do you think and again going back to my uh, idea like of this like the monetary board which is an autonomous uh, independent uh, institution set up under an act in parliament and they have their own you know uh, autonomy to uh, uh, to formulate uh, monetary policy and also actually they can also implement mm. can that kind of bo body work in terms of uh, tax policy 
yes if they give a sort of a genuine as i earlier also said a proposals the policy should be like that uh, i think i i really agree with the the suresh uh, uh, first talked about uh, national tax council something like that so even for such a authority uh, i think if they can take uh, i mean the the ideas of intellectuals like that uh, experienced people uh, i mean in and out of the government entities then i think all the all the, all the research institutes like this and i think uh, yeah have having a good pol- good uh, um, policy and uh, maybe i also agree with him that you know it's not uh, shouldn't be done at the moment maybe in some future uh, with such a uh, intention and such a uh, uh, atmosphere i mean such such a background then it will be okay yes but uh, right now i think uh, uh, going differently is much better uh, as the the taxation activities are different from one to one because imports are taxed by mostly imports but much exports taxing exports are of course uh, something like should be on leg right uh, most of the countries uh, taxing only imports so imports import taxation is coming under the uh, customs and, uh, and the mainly income tax is under the revenue and other several taxes of course excise that's also so i think you can't do everything together right but we can do immediately is to ensure uh, there's very strong uh, links connections uh, yes. among these yes. three institutions yes. Yes. customs yes. department yes. and the inland revenue department yes. the existing uh, link has to be strengthened yes we know basically the practical so issues that we have uh, the the customs they are yes. taking those yes. 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 issues yes. that we have yes. so what we see is basically in practice uh, the coordination uh, among those uh, three institutions uh, could be should be strengthened yes. Yes. and uh, yes the other one that uh, he mentioned with regard to the unique number yes all of us have been talking about this uh, for a long time but that that is something that uh, should be uh, implemented also so this sort of unique id number i think that yeah, is crucial so that it's we have been discussing across all years. all the revenue agencies at all least these are start yeah. right these are these are something that we can start with yes. and also the sharing of information not only among the revenue agencies but as i said yes. among even these other agencies with you know so that that can help the monitoring and the and the enforcement really of tax policy uh, which is something that we are um, struggling with in in sri lanka uh, so i think uh, we are sort of coming to an end um, but uh, is there anything else that you would like to something that uh, we have not brought up but you would like to sort of focus on um, in, in in this well when it comes to tax basically there are so many things and speak but uh, i think uh, for the moment uh, i think we have been speaking a lot uh, uh, let's uh, from my end i would say that just have for yeah. anything that yeah. any having, last words that you yeah, like again the same thing is that having some good consistent policies i mean uh, of course uh, i think uh, as the inland revenue department uh, if we talk about our own situation uh, we can try to minimize some weaknesses we are having which are common to most of the tax administrations in the world and also uh, having uh, public consent about uh, taxes some sort is always uh, social effects are affecting a uh, lot about taxation so with uh, everything thinking that everything work together i mean we can't do it overnight maybe in future then also uh, i mean all the tax uh, practitioners and tax officers working together for a common goal uh, i mean something like a proper tax amount not the minimum minimum not the maximum such a situation will uh, reach the objectives of the country thank you very much uh, to both of you for coming here and, and giving us of your time and your and your expertise in this area i think we uh, we discussed many areas i think some of the thing issues that came up or the uh, was basically consistency of tax policy the importance of that how do we develop that kind of policy in this current institutional framework 
do we need a different kind of uh, uh, institutional structure this whole thing of a national tax council i think that kept coming up uh, an independent uh, body that would be um, given the task of uh, developing tax policy the other thing was of tax of tax paying culture how important that is uh, so you can have the best tax policy or and tax administration system but uh, without a proper tax paying culture or the, the culture within the country also uh, has to be such that it uh, it, it it facilitates uh, tax um, payment and i think there we talked about this whole thing on the social contract between the government and its citizens uh, that it is a two way street uh, when the government provides uh, good services and and high value services to the citizens uh, the citizens have a obligation and a responsibility to uh, to pay the taxes to be able to uh, fund those and i think another um, area that came up was this whole thing of um, in, uh, the sharing of information uh, between the agencies and the co uh, coordination really between uh, the revenue agencies but also with other agencies so that enforcement and monitoring is uh, facilitated uh, so i think there was a very rich discussion uh, so thank you once again and thank you to our audience who was with us and for sending us your questions uh, we will um, continue this conversation and we hope that it will uh, lead of uh, lead into the uh, you know the budget uh, the budget is coming up in in, in uh, about one and a half months and i hope uh, some of these thoughts would be incorporated in the next budget so thank you and good night.